as we look at and turn our attention right now to the Word of God, would you just pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, I open up my heart right now to receive the Word of God. Reveal your heart to me today. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'm telling you, um, God will reveal himself to us. Thank you so much. As we look at the Word of God, we, we, I'm in this series called Joy Stealers. And actually this morning, I, um, I just looked online and some of my favorite ministers and I, I just started just to seeing what they were speaking about this morning. And uh, some of them were speaking on this very same topic that I'm speaking on. Because uh, the one reason why I like to do that, I like to see what God is saying to pastors and what needs to be said in the body of Christ now because what I say here is not just going to stay here. It's going to be online and, and uh, hopefully you'll carry this word and you will share the word and, and uh, you will share the sermon. But obviously the Lord is saying something about joy in this season that we're in right now and how important it is for us to have joy in our lives. So I, I entitled this series Joy Stealers and today's topic that I want to teach on is Fix Your Focus. Fix your focus. So this is what I believe. I believe that God desires for you to live your best life. Now, I don't know what that looks like. I do know God has a plan and a purpose for every life. Amen? But I do know this. He doesn't want your life to be controlled by your mood and your emotions. Anybody had a mood this week? Any, did, did something get on your nerves this week? <laughs> Come on, don't look at your neighbor and say, yeah, it was you, yeah, it was you. <laughs> and our emotions, they can be all over the map, can't they? And it seems like it's hard to control our emotions. Some of you, when you look on uh, social media and all the different media outlets that we have, your emotions began to be charged and, and your mood. And, and when you look at the news outlets and all these kinds of things. But uh, one of the reasons, I, I do believe that the enemy is obsessed with the emotional realm. Um, I, I've talked to parents and, and parents lately who've been sharing with me how their, their children are just going through different things that is affecting them emotionally. And, and so I believe the enemy is obsessed with the emotional realm because he understands the impact the emotional realm has on our decisions and how we're going to live our lives. Have you ever said this? I don't feel like it. You know, it's an emotional decision you're making. How many, I mean, I got up this morning and said, well, I don't feel like preaching this morning. But, but, but actually, I, I did. I, I do feel like preaching. Yesterday, I didn't. Now, if the Lord would have called me on Saturday, it would have been difficult because I had a sinus headache all day and, and uh, you know, uh, allergy junk just yeah, that, that. And so that'll put you in a mood. So I was real careful. I went outside and started cutting the hedges. Boy, they all messed up. <laughs> I'm kidding you, but I did cut them and I, they look okay. They, they could look better. But the enemy is obsessed, I believe, with the emotional realm because he knows if he can get to our emotions and our mood, it will affect our decisions and where we go in life and what we do. The enemy loves to sabotage our emotions. So I've been asking the Lord, Lord, show me a picture of real joy. Is there anybody in here, you just happy all the time? I want to do a survey because, listen, none of us are happy all the time. We're going to go through something, aren't we? We're going to go through things that's going to sabotage our joy or, or our happiness and all those kinds of things. But um, So I'm asking the Lord, God, give us a real picture of joy in our lives. So joy is important 
in our relationship with God. So much the, the so that the Bible instructs us and tells us that the very presence of God is joy. So to be in his presence, the Bible, is fullness of joy. I love that. I love being in the presence of God. So this series is, is to help us discover what is it that is depleting our joy in life, our joy in our relationships, our joy in our careers, our joy in serving the Lord, and how about even serving one another? Let's look at a couple of things here. Happiness. One is happiness. Anybody love to be happy? I love, I've never heard one parent say, I don't want my kids to be happy. Or I don't want my husband to be happy. No, happiness is a key trait. We need happiness. Happiness is a good thing, right? But it is an emotion based on our circumstances and it's based on the outcome of those circumstances. Nothing wrong with happiness. I'm not preaching against it. I love to be happy. I love to wake up happy. I love to go to bed happy. I love to come to church and be happy. You know, and sometimes I come and I got a big smile on my face. I love it when I can be happy like that. And sometimes I just have to make a decision. I'm going to be grateful today because I realize when I sow the seed of gratefulness, I can be more happy in my life. Then joy. What is joy? It's, and, and we're going to, uh, going to define it like this. is a gratitude that is rooted in grace no matter what the circumstances are today. So joy rooted in grace means that you are constantly aware of God's presence in your life and you realize that God somehow you're going to work everything that I am going through to your perfect will and to your glory, right? So the joy Christ gives us as we talked about last week. You remember we talked about Jesus said I'm going to give you my joy. I know you got joy, but you're going to need my joy in order to get through life. So I'm going to leave you something. And not only that, he said, I'm going to leave you my peace. I know you're going to have some peace. You're going to get a job and you're going to be able to pay some bills. And yeah, that's going to bring you some peace. But there's always going to come those setbacks in life where when things are not going so well, where you can still walk in peace, where you can still walk in joy. And that is what God offers us through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we must allow the joy that Christ gives us. We must accept that joy. We must tap into that joy. And I want you to remember this. The Holy Spirit resides on the inside of you. If you are born again, you are a child of God. The Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is inside of you. And sometimes I have to rely upon the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says he's come alongside of us to be our what? Our helper. So sometimes I have to say, help me with some joy today. There's nothing wrong with that. Lord, help me to be patient today with my kids. There's nothing wrong with that. Lord, help me to be long-suffering. Lord, help me to be kind you know how they treated me. Come on, somebody. Sometimes you just got to tap in, right? Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, you need to tap into the Holy Spirit. Yes. Tap into the Holy Spirit. When you look at the book of Ephesians, it's referred to as the book of joy. In the Jesus Bible, if you look at that translation, the title page reads like this, Jesus, our joy in suffering. In Philippians, Paul writes this. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Incidentally, as you remember, Paul is writing this while he's actually suffering in prison. Why? For uh, preaching Jesus. For uh, preaching Jesus to the people. So he is in 
a, a circumstance that normally would have taken his joy, but he said this, my joy is rooted in something much greater than my circumstance. And this morning, I want you to get this because this is so important that you grasp this concept today. Your joy must be rooted in something much greater than your circumstance. Your joy has to be rooted in something better than a job. Your joy has to be rooted in something much better than the trials and the test of this life. It is so important that you grasp that concept today because you're going to have to fight for this kind of joy, the kind of joy that, uh, again, it rises above circumstances and the trials that we face. Joy doesn't always come naturally to us. I wish I was that kind of person that woke up so, I want to use this word, I don't know, so perky. That's the only word comes to mind. And just so, you know, just like so happy, just like bouncing off. Anybody know anybody like that? They just like bouncing off the wall? Yeah, yeah. come on. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, what are they on? Can you just give me some of that? Can can you get that in a vitamin or something? Because I, I would like to have some of that. You know, and I've realized that as I've gotten older, sometimes it's, I struggle a little bit more to, to get that, that uh, level. My wife tells me this all the time. She said, you are the most level person I've ever seen. I'm like, you the same. I mean, like, you, you, do you ever have one of these days, you know? I'm like, yeah, I have those on the inside. But I'm trying not to let it affect me on the outside. Because on the inside, I've got the Holy Spirit. On the inside, I've got the, the fruit of the Spirit, and he helps me shut my mouth when I don't need to say something. Oh, oh but you daddy. But sometimes being daddy means you need to be quiet and live by example. Amen? Amen. Having the Holy Spirit on the inside to help us to keep my joy. Because I know what I can keep saying that's going to ruin my day and ruin everybody else's day around me. You know what I'm talking about. Don't, don't look at me like a new calf looking at a gate. <laughs> Fight for it. Because you live in a battle, not a bubble. There's a warfare going on. You know, for your joy, for your peace, and, and the pandemic we've gone through, and, and the election, and things like that, that, that we're going, the political climate of our world, and, and everything that's going on. And people are trying to decide what they believe today. People are deciding what's good, what's bad. And, and when you look at things, there's a lot of good here, and then, and then mixed in that mixology, there's a little bad. And you, you look on this side, there's good and there's bad. Can I tell you, when you're look up it's always good when you look at your heavenly father it's always good and he wants you to have joy in this life and you know me I, I've said this I've made this statement many times from the pulpit I don't want to get old and get ugly and angry and bitter with my because of what's going on in the world I want to get old and people look at me like, can I have some of what you got? It's called Geritol. I mean, you know. <laughs> and so where we're going today is this. Joy is a focus, not a feeling. Now, I, I realize you can feel it. But joy has to be a focus in your life. We think joy is when I make my next career move or my next relationship or, or it's just waiting around the corner somewhere for me. But James shows us something that may be familiar but is a strange, strange approach to joy when you consider what he says about the subject. So let's go to James chapter 1. Start with verse 2 there. It says, My brethren, count it all joy... 
when you fall into various trials. Now, when you look at this concept, what he is saying here is when you fall into various trials, he gives um, uh, this, this opinion here as if it caught you by surprise. You fell into this trial that you was not expecting what you're going through. You were not expecting this kind of trial. You would have never have picked this kind of trial for your life. But he goes on to say, there's something you must know. That the testing of your faith produces patience. And this patience right here is also translated as endurance or steadfastness. So he says, so let patience or endurance have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, I also want to address this word perfection here and this lacking nothing that he is saying here in, uh, in verse 4. This perfection is not a sinless life that he is talking about. It means getting to the place of spiritual maturity where you have spiritual uh, uh, contentment and spiritual fulfillment in your life and you have a spiritual endurance that no matter what you go through, you realize in Christ I am complete. That is what he is saying here. You mean, can I get to the place where I don't like nothing, that all my bills are paid? You know what? You can be a wise steward. You can use wisdom in your finance, and that can help all of that, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get out of debt if you're just making bad choices all the time. People didn't like that. Okay. I love the NC. Uh, v version it says my brothers and sisters when you have many kinds of troubles you should be full of joy now if you stop right there you're like well there's something wrong with me <laughs> obviously I'm not in the right church I got the wrong pastor you know I got the wrong teacher <laughs> I, I'm reading the wrong Bible. you know obviously there's something wrong here but you got to read on because you know that these troubles test your faith and this will give you patience. Again, that word patience is translated endurance as well. So let your patience show itself perfectly in what you do. Then you will be perfect and complete and will have everything you need. So scripture is giving us this distinction, if you will, of joy. What it means to have joy when, uh, when you are a believer and you are facing various kinds of trials. And one of the things I want to note here is, first of all, he tells us there are many kinds of trials. We don't all experience the same kinds of trials. Amen? We are not going, all going through the same things, but we are all going through something. There are many different kinds of trials as there are paint colors at Sherwin-Williams. Amen? There are trials that are associated with plenty. There are uh, trials that are associated with poverty. There are young people trials. There are middle-aged trials. Then there's old people trials. Come on, somebody. There are single people trials, married people trials, trials associated with loneliness, trials associated with companionship. There are many different kinds of trials. Some of you are like this. Well, man, I'd like to trade one of my trials if I could. I'd like to have one of them rich people trials if I could for a while. I just like to try that out and see what that feels like. Then there's married people trials. Well, you know, I'd like to try that out a little bit, you know, see what married people trials look like. Can I tell you something? Everybody's got trials. And please don't think it's strange that you're going through something. Please don't think it's strange that you're having a hard time in a certain area of your life. So this morning, it is wrong to associate joy with status and success in life as we look at people. Um, I know a very successful woman had multiple homes. I mean, I mean not just any home. I'm, I'm talking these grandiose homes. I mean, big, beautiful homes on, on the ocean, oceanfront homes and, and no debt 
bills paid in full kind of thing. But she lived her life every time I spoke with her in worry and fret over her children till the very day she died. She struggled to even enjoy the blessings that she had in her life. So much to so that uh, she even went through a divorce because she didn't focus on her husband at all either. James is making a distinction here that there are many kinds of trials and we all don't have the same kinds of trials but everybody here and everybody watching online today you're dealing with something in life and I want to say this be kind to everybody even when somebody's rude to you because you never know exactly what they're going through. And no matter how great your name is in the eyes of people, you can still have trials that want to suck the joy out of your life. And remember, joy is not a byproduct of what people say about you. Joy is not a byproduct of how people hold you in high esteem. There are many different kinds of trials and everybody is going through something. Most people don't understand the difference between a temptation and a trial. So when James says trials of many kinds, he could have easily have said or referred to the economic hardships and the persecution that the church was going through at the time. But it's important to know the distinction between kinds of trials that you will experience in your life. Otherwise, you might spend your years blaming the devil for bad choices. Some of our trials are the result of the evil that we live in in this world. Jesus said this, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. It's going to happen. People are not always going to like you. And that alone brings up all kinds of spiritual warfare. If you don't know the difference between a temptation and trial, you'll try to use the wrong tool on the trial. Because when tempted, the Bible teaches us resistance. When we are being tempted, he said, I want you to resist this. So when you are tempted to steal, the strategy that God gives us in the word is, I want you to resist that impulse to take something that does not belong to you. That may have helped somebody. When you face a trial, often the key in trials is not resistance, but listen, acceptance it's important to see the difference because there are things we are accepting that we should be resisting and there are things we are resisting that we should be accepting James said trials are producing patient endurance in our lives and James 1 5 says but if any of you need wisdom you should ask God for it for what he is generous to everyone and will give you wisdom without criticizing you. I need wisdom to know the difference of what I need to be accepting and what I need to be resisting in my life. Some of the trials you are facing in your family is called puberty. You can't cast it out. I've tried. <laughs> Come on, you can't wish it away. It's called hormones. Don't let it take your joy. I promise you, you're going to get through it. Then there are some trials that you must accept. It is producing patience in your life. It is producing endurance in your life. Why? Because the Lord wants you to make it all the way to the end. Because at the end of this thing, as they sang this morning, heaven is for all of us. But not all of us are going to make it there because some won't endure to the end. you got to endure to the end. So trials are producing something. There are trials that you must accept. It is producing endurance. And all these trials, what are they doing in my life? They are testing my faith. Anybody with me this morning? Yeah. Pastor, my faith. Ooh it's being tested. So my Bible even says, even as by fire... At times, See, there is another distinction that we need to address here too. And there is a distinction between joy and pleasure. Pleasure can be associated with joy. 
But joy is not dependent upon finding pleasure in something. Let me give you a better picture of this. There seems to be more than ever the want, this wanting of pleasure. I call it the feel-good syndrome. I just want to feel good. You know, it's about a feeling, this feel-good syndrome. And, with, and uh, they want this sensation because if they don't have this feel-good syndrome, uh, or if I don't get enough likes on my Instagram, you know, uh, you know I, I've even had people to, to say this. Did, did you like what I posted? Did, did you not like it because you, like, you didn't hit like? I need you to hit like. I'm like, I, I, I've... I've I've seen many posts and I just don't hit nothing. Why I got to hit something? Don't get your self-esteem tied to a like. Because everybody ain't going to like what you post and everybody ain't going to like you. Come on, let's be real, right? (laughs) I'm going to help somebody out today. Social media has sensationalized our viewing experiences through the lives of people, lives, and I want to say this, lives that are filtered to give us this unrealistic approach of their life. As if I got it all together and you don't. Giving us the illusion that there is something wrong with me if I'm not completely happy all the time. That within itself is a big illusion and a bigger problem right there. Why? Because nobody's happy all the time, just like I said. The pressure then is to feel pleasure. Because if I don't feel pleasure, I'm miserable. Can anybody just sit with yourself? Or you always got to have somebody. (laughs) Sister Ethel said, not only can I sit by myself, I can live by myself. (laughs) Hello. And I I hear some of y'all, I just wish I could live by myself. I've been trying to kick them out. (laughs) Been trying. (laughs) We're living in a generation that thinks joy is associated with a feeling in their flesh. Now, it can be but it doesn't have to be. Joy can bring a feeling, but doesn't necessarily start with a feeling. So for our example today, I want us to look and consider Jesus. There are times we find our joy controlled by circumstances and situations, but Jesus gives us a picture that stands contrary to the cultural expectation of joy. Think of this. Jesus is on the cross. Jesus is being ridiculed. He is spat upon. He is mocked by his own creation. Then we read in Hebrews 12, 2, that we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. Let's look at that scripture. Fixing our eyes on who? Fixing our eyes on who? Not culture. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer. And he says he is the perfecter of faith. Notice what he goes on to say. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And what is this this meaning of for the joy set before him? It's almost like a runner who, who, who doesn't just focus on the next step, but he focuses on the finish line. I'm going to finish my race. It's like the builder who is constructing a home. Uh, He's laying the foundation. He's building the walls. But his goal is an end result, and that is a magnificent home that someone's going to enjoy. Can I tell you this this morning? Your race is going to be filled with joy when you continually set your focus on Christ. Set your focus on him. And notice this, Jesus set something before him. Some, you cannot set this before you every day and have joy. <laughs> oh, man, you can't. You know, uh, that car, you can't set your focus on a car, an automobile, or a house, or things like that. You know, we, got, we must endure I, I, I need to tell the church this this morning. You must endure the race. 
Right now, Ryan is in the Navy. He's in boot camp. He is enduring. We send him letters almost daily saying, you can do this, you can do this. And just spurring him on and encouraging him, you can make it, you can be a seal. God's hand is on your life. You need to tell your children that ever, God's hand is on your life. And <laughs> it's so important. You know what I love about where he's at right now? They took his cell phone away. You can't have a phone. During training, no. You can't get on Facebook. You can't get on Instagram. Why? Because we need your focus. This is life and death. Where we're going to be sending you out in the battle is life and death. And your decisions are important. So what we're going to do, we're taking your cell phone away. Whoop. I'm helping some parents out today, and the kids ain't liking it. <laughs> Mama going to take my cell phone. It would be good if we could just turn them off at times, amen, and just walk away. And I love that. And, and even this, they went so far as to say, you're cut, we're cutting all connection off with your family for just briefly. Because we need you to focus. Uh, and we need you... To realize, do you want to be here or you want to go home? So I want to ask all my Christians out there and want to be Christians. You're looking in and you're, you're trying to decide if, you know, if I really want this or not. Are you all in? Where is your focus? Because I can tell you this, everything that we're going through in life is pulling for our focus. It does not want me to focus on the spiritual side of me. I, I, it wants me to focus on my flesh and what pleases me, what makes me happy. Being on the golf course, being at the beach, doing something else, trying to escape. But I'm going to tell you, I thank every last one of you this morning for waking up this morning. I'm going to feed my spirit today. I'm I'm going to feed my soul today. I'm going to focus on what truly, truly matters in my life. I need to get some focus. You can't be out here. you got to be here. With your life, you got to be intentional. You must filter your trials through Jesus and his word. So joy is a point of view. Joy is a way of looking at things and looking beyond trials. Come on, this should help us with always needing to feel a certain way. Joy is not necessarily the absence of sadness in your life. Joy is not necessarily the ab absence of trials and hard times in our lives. Look at Jesus. The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the most unimaginable suffering. Jesus set something before him besides the cross. Jesus set something uh, in front of him besides the, the stripes upon his back. Jesus set something uh, uh, before him besides the suffering and the trial that he was going through. In order for him to endure the cross, he didn't find joy in the event. He found joy in the guaranteed outcome. Amen. Defeating. Think about this. The guaranteed outcome. If I follow through, if I endure the cross and the suffering. Defeating death, hell, and the grave. Guaranteed outcome. Restoring the, our relationship with the Heavenly Father, a guaranteed outcome. Defeating sin over our lives. Defeating Satan, guaranteed outcome. Because of the guaranteed outcome that he set before him, he was willing to endure the shame. He was willing to endure the rejection of people. He was willing to be despised all because joy was the guaranteed outcome. He knew this is going to bring the Father joy. You need to know that there is a guaranteed outcome for your trials as well. You're not going through this for nothing. I, I've been so proud of Rhett as he is recovering from having his colon completely removed. This is my middle son. and 
And uh, as you know, for 12 years, he has struggled with ulcerated colitis and, and it got so bad that his colon was collapsing and, and he was not going to be able to, to go any further. He was very sick, um, went down to 95 pounds at one time. It just looked like we were going to lose him at one point. But I, I, we just kept holding on to God. Uh, and, and I would always tell Janet and Janet would always tell me when the enemy would show us the death of our son we always would picture him married with kids that's a long shot right there I wonder I don't know if he's got a potential or not but uh, he ain't even dating right now you know what I'm saying but we would always picture him married and with children and us finally getting grandchildren I mean I told him we're gonna be 90 by that time, you're just going to keep them at the house because I ain't going to feel like I'm coming over. <laughs> but the enemy will paint a picture for you. And you'll have to resist it because it, it, it'll depress you. It'll, it'll just weigh you down and it'll make you heavy, right? And, and, and what I love about what Rhett decided to do, and I love his, uh, I, I love his focus. He said, since I can't change it, I'm going to accept it, I'm going to endure it, and I'm going to make it productive in my life. He started an online support group for people who have lost their colon and are wearing a bag. And he gets up, every, he's so excited, he goes into Zoom meetings sometimes. He said, Dad, I was on a Zoom meeting for four hours encouraging people who have lost their colon. He's 24 years old. But there are people suffering, uh, suffering with this disease. And he's turning it around. He said, Dad, he, he endured for 12 years. Now the disease is completely out of his body. And he, ahead of him is major, major, major surgeries. You know, there's two more major surgeries. But I love his outlook. He texts me, and I have never gotten this text before. And he, so I apologize if I break up when I try to read it. Right? He texts me. I'm going to just tell you. He texts me and he said, I feel great. I've never felt this good. Out of pain. Can I tell you something? When I saw him suffering for 12 years, and my wife will vouch for this, my mom, and I never heard him one time complain about why me he endured it but can I tell you this there was a guaranteed outcome I don't know what the outcome is in your life and, and what it looks like I mean there were people that prayed that he wouldn't have to lose his colon he lost his colon and you know what he said I don't care if I don't have a colon I can still live some of y'all living without a kidney. You got two of them. You know what I'm saying? Some of y'all living without a brain, but you're still going. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Hello. We see it all over all the time, don't we? You got to find joy. Set something before you. Oh, my gosh. If you missed prayer time Wednesday night, you missed it. Janet came in. And she taught about prayer, about setting something before you. And she went and put together a prayer board for her family and for the kids and, and, and our, our jobs and what we do. And she sets it before her every day in prayer. Can I tell you, it may be good for all of us to start setting something. Take a picture of those grandkids. Lay your hands on them. Pray over their lives. Amen. Your children, your grandchildren, your pastor. If you don't have a picture of nobody else, Google me. <laughs> may not be the prettiest thing you've ever seen, but pray for me. Amen. Guaranteed outcomes. Can I tell you, we all have a guaranteed outcome. We won't go through this forever. Jesus said, I am coming back. 
and I'm coming back for you and you and you and you and you. I'm coming back for you. We have a guaranteed outcome. But until he comes back, we must endure whatever we have to endure. Until he comes back, your faith is going to be tested. Your faith is going to be tried. But can I tell you this? It's going to produce something inside of you, Jesus said. It's going to produce a guaranteed outcome. You're going to be focused, more focused than ever before. You're going to make it to heaven. You're going to make it to heaven. When was the last somebody time somebody said that you were going to make it to heaven? Most of them look at you and think, well, he's going to bust hell wide open. <laughs> and sometimes you feel like it, don't you? But let me tell you something. If you will endure, if you will fix your eyes on Jesus, you're going to make it to heaven. I don't know what you're going to go go through but there are various kinds of trials and everybody's got their own thing that's trying to take the joy out of your life but I want to encourage somebody today quit focusing on the bad and start focusing on Jesus he endured the suffering because there was a guaranteed outcome. He said weeping may endure for the night, but the guaranteed outcome is joy. You're not going to cry always. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but there is a guaranteed outcome. I will deliver you out of them all. That's the guaranteed outcome. <laughs> I remind you, Jesus didn't find joy in hanging on the cross. Nobody would. Even though he was the son of God, he felt the nails. He felt the spear. He felt the rejection. He felt the pain, the weight of sin. His suffering was for a greater purpose. And you and I, our pain, our suffering, our trials is for a greater purpose. We may never understand it all. And you may not figure it all out. But can I tell you this? There is a guaranteed outcome for you, for every last one of us. Amen? Think of Jesus. His suffering impacted the whole world. Today, you're living a total different life because of Jesus. Right? When Jesus hung on the cross, he wasn't surprised by the shame. He accepted it. He accepted it. He wasn't surprised by the suffering and the rejection and the pain and the nails. He got through it because he set something before him. He realized, I will have to endure this. I will have to go through this. I will have to endure the cross, the rejection, the suffering. But on the other side, somebody say, but on the other side of this, there's going to be joy. On the other side of this, I'm going to defeat death, hell, and the grave. On the other side of this, I'm going to restore the relationship that was lost through sin. That brought joy to Jesus. Joy is a focus before it's a feeling. So while you're chasing a feeling called joy, I come to realize it's not based on the trial that I'm going through at the moment. It's based on my focus. When I fix my eyes upon him, James said this, count it all joy. And the only way that you and I can do that is our focus on Christ. When you focus on the trial, when you focus on what you went through, everything, your losses, it's tough. But James is saying you won't overcome the trial by praying for a feeling Some of y'all just want to feel saved again. <laughs> I get it. Some days I feel like, am I even saved? Lord, where are you at? And we want a feeling so bad, don't we? I just want to feel saved. No, you got to know you're saved. Because feelings are going to come and go. Some days you're going to feel like Jesus is right there beside you. Some days you're going to feel like he ain't within a million miles of me. You know what I'm saying? That's going to happen in life. Come on. So James is saying you, you won't overcome the trial 
by just praying for the feeling. Instead of resisting it, accept it, fix your eyes on Jesus and endure and get through it. Your faith is being tested right now and you can endure. And while your faith is being tested, it's producing endurance, it's, it's producing patience in your life. What is happening here is your faith is being perfected. It's working for your good good so when you're suffering through trials patience is the last thing I want to hear how about you I just want out of it however patience improves your ability to accept the trial that you're going through that is producing something on the inside of you through all Jesus sufferings he remained patient and he endured it, knowing that there would be a guaranteed outcome. Amen? As we get ready to close, I was thinking about this, that what the church is going through, the global church, not just local, talk to many, many, many pastors. And our faith is being groomed I believe for the last days if there's ever a time you need to get your eyes off of everything that's going on in the world and get your focus back on Jesus I received a text from a staff member at Gateway Church um, Pastor Morris's church sent me a text Last night, please pray for my son. 24 years old, been in church all of his life, walked in the door and said, I am renouncing my faith in Christ. I no longer believe in Christ. He said, we are devastated. When you take your eyes off Jesus, beware. False doctrine, false teachers... All kind, the world is spinning out of control. They need to see somebody steadfast. They need to see somebody immovable that you're going to stay through thick and thin. Can I speak to dads right now? Stay in that marriage through thick and thin. Wife, I know he ain't the best all the time. We men have our ups and downs. But let me tell you something. It's important to work it out. I told Janet one day, I said, Honey, if you ever pack your bags and leave, I'm leaving with you. I can't cook. <laughs> you know, I need you, baby. I need you. Let's work this out. Amen. Fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the author of your life. He's your manufacturer. Not only that, the Bible says, author and finisher of our faith. He's going to make sure you got everything you need through faith to endure all the way to the end. Your faith is important. People are allowing the trials that they're going through, pull them away from their faith. Where, the, where, where people are saying, I just need a feeling. I, I need to feel good about what I'm going through. Who told you that? Who told you you had to feel good to stay married? you you had to feel good to go to church who told you you had to feel good to serve in the house of the Lord what lies are we listening to your joy is based on enduring you didn't get that degree at college because you gave up your freshman year you got it because you endured your freshman year your junior year, your senior year, your sophomore, you endured. 
long nights, staying up all night. Who told you you had to feel good about something? Oh, everybody's trying to catch this feel-good thing. Oh, I'm going to go to church and, and I'm going to try to catch the Holy Ghost so I can feel good. A feeling don't last. It won't. I don't care if you run, jump, holler, scream, shout, dance. I don't care what you do. You're going to go through something in life. And Jesus is going to make sure your faith is being tested like everybody else's. We all got various kinds of trials. As the praise team is coming, I'm going to keep going if y'all don't come on. What brings you joy? What do you focus on that brings you joy in your life? Have you ever thought about that? We all know what doesn't bring us joy, don't we? We, we know exactly what doesn't bring us joy. It's not looking, listen, at your neighbors and seeing their big house or seeing their car or seeing their bling bling or, 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 or their shoes or, or, or whatever they're wearing. You know, can I tell you, the biggest sabotage to joy is comparison. When you start comparing what somebody has, people just like this all the time, just comparing. It's like, look what they got, look what they got. Well, I must be doing something wrong, you know. You know, comparing themselves to one another. Comparing their spouse. Oh, my God, please get off soap operas and all that junk and television you look at all these things like they got the perfect marriage we've been told that before you know that it's not perfect sometimes I have to set her straight <laughs> sometimes I look at her no you're not no -uh. no you know what no marriage is perfect can I go ahead and just bust that out no, you work at it. I work at it when I get up till the day I go to bed. Amen. To the end of the day, I work on it. She works on it. I try to be nice. I try to be kind. I try to be a good husband. Except for yesterday. <laughs> yesterday I had a headache. It didn't feel good. So I just went outside, like I said, and I just trimmed the shrubs. And then I went and got in the pool right by myself. I didn't want nobody with me. I got on my float right by myself and I laid before the Lord and said, Lord, I'm just going to focus on you because I'm hot and I'm sweaty. Can I tell you, the church is just wanting to catch something. I've heard people say, when's revival coming? It's here. Lift up your head. Your redemption draweth nigh. If you want to draw close to him, draw close to him. And when you come to the Lord, don't come expecting a feeling. Well, I saw them and, and they trembled, they shook, they, they cried, they even fell out on the floor. You may not do none of that. You may just stand there. But let me tell you something. You stand there with your resolve and your faith in Christ. God, whatever I'm going through will have to go through. God, I trust you. I believe you with my life. Come on, there's something to be said for the people who keep showing up Sunday after Sunday, week after week, trial after trial. Many are the afflictions, right, of the righteous. But can I tell you, we can endure till the very end. And you can do it with joy. You can do it with peace. You can know in your heart today that if I go through something when I wake up tomorrow he's with me I may cry all night long but the guaranteed result is joy Woo. amen maybe a better way to pray is not ask for more joy but God help me fix my eyes on you Maybe you just need to say this morning, Pastor, I'm with you. Other things have had my attention.
pandemic, corona, politics, you name it, my kids, my spouse, my problems, my job, my money. <laughs> Blame your dog. You know what I'm saying? We all got them. But somewhere, church, we got to quit living off of a feeling to serve God. Because if you live off a feeling trying to serve God, you won't make it all the way to the end. Amen? Nothing in life is permanent. Only Jesus. Don't base your joy on something that can never fulfill you. Amen? It could bring you happiness. But there is a joy that Jesus said, I'm going to leave with you. You can be single and still have joy. You can be in the middle of one of the hardest trials of your life. And deep within, there is a settled assurance of joy that you can tap in through the Holy Spirit. When life is trying to suck the very life out of you. And that comes with knowing Jesus. That comes with fixing your focus on Jesus. That comes with a relationship that Jesus said, I got to endure the cross. Because I want a relationship with these people. And can I tell you this? Don't fix your eyes on the cross. Can I say that? I want to tell you what. Don't fix your eyes on the cross. He's not on the cross. We don't serve a dead Jesus. We serve a alive Jesus. He didn't say he was going to stay on the cross. No. The Bible says when I leave here, I'm going to the right hand of the Father. And I'm going to make intercession for my people. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send a comforter to them. I'm going to be with them. Can I tell you? So when you fix your eyes on Jesus, you need to look up. Come on, he's in heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's seated there in a place of authority. And he said, you can approach my throne. Hallelujah, anytime you want to. Day or night, it's a throne of grace. It's a throne of mercy. He said, you will find a help and rest for your soul. Aren't you grateful this morning? If you need prayer, our prayer team is here this morning. I don't want to leave here today without somebody getting your focus right. We've got people that are hurting, making decisions that you don't need to be making during a trial like you're going through right now. You need your shepherd. I said, the Lord is my shepherd. Amen. He's our shepherd, folks. The Lord wants to lead you. What David was saying here, I don't know the way, but you know the way. And I need you to be my shepherd. I need you to lead me, Lord. I need you to guide me. Anybody this morning, if you need prayer, please come. We'll be glad to pray for you. But this morning, I want you to leave here with this last scripture. And I, I, I love this scripture because it talks about food. Because y'all fitting to go eat, aren't you? Enjoy your food today. My wife, I told her, I said, where are you taking me? Where are you going to take me? I want to know where are you going to take me to eat today. Can we just read this together? Because the people were weary. And Nehemiah instructed them, you got this food. I want you to sit and enjoy it. And he said, not only that, he said, I want you to take some of this stuff you enjoy, like chocolate cake. And I want you to share it with somebody else. It's hard to share chocolate cake, ain't it? But let's read this together. Go and enjoy choice food and sweet dreams and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. What a great verse. You know what the Lord is saying? 
there's a guaranteed outcome. I don't want you to keep grieving. I want you to enjoy fellowship. I want you to enjoy your life while you're here. Listen, you're going to be in heaven. Quit waiting to be happy till you get to heaven. Who does that? If you need friends, talk to somebody. If you want to fellowship with somebody, ask them to go out to eat and pay for it. Oh, that's a good thing. I'm waiting on you. I love you. Go and enjoy your food and get something sweet to drink. Amen. Love you guys. Enjoy the Lord as your strength.